Welcome everybody to today's Family Medicine Grand Rounds for September 7th. Um, if you are registering for CME credit, uh, please make note of the activity code listed here. I will go through some additional information um, in case that's necessary for newer people or for people that haven't registered yet. But if you are registering, make sure you do that before midnight tonight with the activity code listed. Next slide. So for those who have not yet registered, if you need to do that, make sure you send your email address to the toll-free number listed there. Once you've done that, you'll get a confirmation that your account was um, created. And then from there, each of the sessions, you'll just need to text attend and the activity code for that date to the same number. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or the CME office. Next slide. So as we get started here, just want to take a moment to remind those of you um, watching, if you could make sure that your microphone is muted, um, if you'll remain attentive and engaged in the session, and then I will also, towards the end of the session, um, I'll be putting in the link so that we can provide feedback to our speakers. Um, and as far as questions during the session, if you want to put those in the chat box, we'll take a look at those um, towards the end of the session. Next slide. So this is the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds. We just want to make sure that we mention that we are partnered with the South Central AHEC and our mission statement is listed. Next slide. Uh, for those who are claiming CME credits, um, be sure to check every so often to make sure that those credits are showing up on your transcript. Um, you can do that by visiting the website address there for our CME office. Um, but if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to them or you can reach out to myself as well. Next slide. Also, those who are AAFP members, um, this presentation um, does count towards credit through their system as well. So if you are a member, please um, keep that in mind. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to the AAFP or to me as well. Next slide. We also like to mention that it is the goal of our Family Medicine Grand Rounds to address these nationally established physician core competencies that you see listed here. Next slide. And we will also just mention that Dr. Cepeda and Dr. Camp Schmidt, as well as their faculty mentor, Dr. Montanez, have no um, financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Next slide. Um, so they're going to present for us um, today. Um, poems on um, low back pain, specifically evidence-based management of chronic lower back pain and primary care. It's a review of systemic analyses of imaging and treatment modalities. So I will let them get started. Good morning. <clears throat> Thanks again for joining us by Zoom. I do apologize. I know we were looking forward to getting together in person, unfortunately. Uh, Got a little sick and uh, my six month old brought us uh, a present from daycare. So I am and tied up at home for the time being, but again, I appreciate everyone's flexibility. So today, what we're gonna be investigating is chronic lower back pain. It is one of the most frequent chief complaints bringing patients into the primary care office, as well as many emergency offices. And it's uh, pretty frustrating both for the patients and for the providers to try and provide care. Um, it's very nuanced and the burden of costs, both financially and indirectly is, mounting um, and gets very, very rough. So in order to efficiently deliver care, we wanna make sure that we're regularly reviewing the literature and the research um, and making sure that we're keeping up with that. Uh, and that's where the POEMS program comes in. So the patient-oriented evidence that matters, they're developed to allow us um, to, to regularly address clinical questions that we face pretty frequently um, and adjust our methodologies for, um, for what the current research uh, supports. So today we're going to review two of these articles, um, both evaluating MRI results with patients and comparing how a quote unquote traditional or a clinical reporting uh, would influence the patient's perceptions of their pain and um, analyze a systematic review that was done of some randomized control trials examining some common management strategies for common lower back pain in the primary care setting. So as you can see here, um, these are our objectives that we're hopefully going to lay out for you guys pretty clearly. Um, and again, if there are any questions, please just let us know in the chat box. 
So just a little bit of background on common lower back pain. As we said, up to 60% in some studies um, showing patients with lifetime issues with back pain. Um, in the United States, uh, several surveys have demonstrated that this can cause up to 5% of community healthcare visits um, and up to 7.4% of emergency department visits in the year 2020. Um, back symptoms are the seventh most frequent presenting complaint in the emergency department and up to 2.3% of all visits. And as patients aged um, with brackets, including up to 65 and older, um, that complaint becomes more and more common. And as we have a generally aging population, that's going to be something that we're going to be presented with, I believe, even more frequently. In analyzing these emergency care visits and community health care visits, some of the most frequent interventions applied are things including ibuprofen and acetaminophen um, for general body aches, and that's prescribed in up to 5% of our visits. So um, overall, um, these interventions in this problem is something that we are presented with rather frequently on an probably a daily basis. Um, as we mentioned, it's an enormous benefit, not only to the patient, but to the healthcare system, um, not only in the, the cost of medications, treatments, imaging to the patient themselves, but in addition to time lost, um, it's one of the most frequent um, causes for disability and absence from work. Um, and it's uh, as of, I believe, 2015, estimated an annual cost of about $87.6 billion um, to the U.S. economy. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that can generally predispose someone as a risk factor for chronic lower back pain, but generally accepted the risk factors would be things including obesity, smoking, age, physically strenuous work, or sedentary work. So both ends of the spectrum, unfortunately, are going to put us at risk. Um, the etiologies for this pain at source are generally nonspecific. They might be related to things like radiculopathy or spinal stenosis or other potential causes, but in general, there's no specific uh, cause that's most of the time being able to be demonstrated as the particular etiology. As far as preventative strategies stand right now, the USPSTF does not have um, sufficient evidence, so it's an eye for prevention for lower back pain. There's, there's no specific intervention available for us for prevention strategies. So in preparing to address these that are gonna be coming into the office, it's important to have some evidence backing this up. There have been research into things like back stretching or exercise strengthening or modification of risk factors for individuals who are in particularly um, at-risk populations like construction workers or those who are generally doing a lot of heavy lifting on a regular basis. Um, however, the research has been insufficient for supporting any intervention as preventative. The initial evaluation and continued evaluations are, and it's very, very nuanced, as we all know. Um, just like any problem, eliciting a very detailed history is going to be key, trying to decide if there are any inciting events um, or any specific modifiable risk factors that can be adjusted, specifically things like the strenuous workload or available rest, um, weight uh, and smoking. Um, and then a detailed physical exam is going to be important. Generally, <clears throat> excuse me, the studies uh, can help us to categorize these into three kind of general areas of pain. It can either be nonspecific. Uh, it could be potentially associated with radiculopathy or spinal stenosis or another specific spinal cause. Imaging is not necessarily always indicated, but we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a moment. Um, some of the conservative management strategies that generally we all know about and reach for are going to include here this list. Uh, most frequently, and what we try to get patients to engage with are things like physical therapy and exercise therapy, structured exercise programs that can be demonstrated to show some long-term benefits. Um, but you know, we always want to find out something that can more immediately give, give somebody some relief. And so that's why things like oral or topical and say it's um, acetaminophen. Um, and maybe even things like topical rubifacin, spinal manipulation, acupuncture, all these sorts of things come in. Unfortunately, what the vast majority seems to come to is that we're using things like oral opioids uh, to try and control this. However, due to what we know is a very serious epidemic across uh, all areas of healthcare, opioids are, are not generally found to be a very effective strategy. We'll talk a little bit about that as well in the RCT reviews, but um, trying to decrease the need and the dependence of, for patients on opioids for relief of this pain is paramount. 
some of the things that can be a generalized red flag and kind of want to trigger us for a little bit more serious evaluation and intervention, things that <clears throat> might quickly trigger imaging needs um, are things like being age over 50, demonstrating fever and chills, a significant traumatic injury, um, saddle anesthesia, uh, and a history of immunosuppression or failure of conservative management. These are all kind of our red flag symptoms that we want to keep an eye out for in general to try and help someone probably moving on to a more serious evaluation than just what's going to be done in the clinic. Okay, and just a, one more point prior to going into our first article is that despite all of this advanced imaging like MRIs, uh, they're commonly used in the evaluation of back pain, but they don't really change the outcome. So an MRI can reveal the abnormality um, and oftentimes it is what a patient has, but it's not what's causing that patient's specific complaint. And so this article is an aim to explore the consequences of MRI usage reporting for low back pain. Next slide, please. So the title is Catast The Catastrophization Effects of an MRI Report on the Patient and Surgeon and the Benefits of Clinical Reporting, which we'll learn what that is in a bit, results from an RCT and blinded trials. So this was an RCT consisting of three phases. In the first phase, we had a big group of 44 patients and all of these had lower back pain for at least three months or more. No one in this group had red flags and um, they did also did not have a clinical indication for surgery. Then that big group was divided into two groups. Um, and for group A, there was one way of relaying results, which was it's just routine MRI findings explained factually. The way it comes out on the impression is the way that it was explained to the patient. For group B, they were explained that the MRI is within normal findings. And although there are some things that are abnormal, they are incidental. They're common degenerative changes, um, but are likely noted to be normal consequences of aging rather than an acute pathology uh, that would require further intervention. So both of these groups were assessed with uh, some pain assessment tools at right in the beginning, um, then right after the MRI, and then six weeks post the MRI. Next slide, please. So the tools that they used for this study were, uh, was the VAS, the visual analog scale that will assess pain um, severity. The PSEQ2 is a pain self-efficacy questionnaire and that will assess how the patient is perceiving the pain. Uh, and then the SF12, PCS, which is physical and MCS, which is mental, will assess their functional status. Um, and these were the ones that that they repeated at the six week mark. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of VAS. Um, and I think this one is the one we're most familiar with. Um, it will assess pain. There's also a verbal scale here on the bottom, which will say no pain, mild pain, if you're ranging between one to three. Um, and that would also mean that you have some minimal impacts on ADLs. Um, then from four to six would be that moderate pain with moderate impact on ADLs. And then seven to 10 is severe pain and every, your ADLs are severely impacted by your pain. Uh, the next slide uh, talks about, this is a pain um, self-efficacy questionnaire. Um, and it basically grades on a scale of zero to, 10, uh, zero to six which would zero would be not at all confident and six is that they're completely confident in how they're able to perform their activities while they are in pain. So I can confidently do my chores or think or enjoy things or um, cope with my pain. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, the last one, I, I didn't put a picture of it, but it, that one was the short form uh, 12. And that one basically just talks about the functional status. Um, so it'll ask questions on like what the role limitations are to your physical activities, emotional and mental activities, and how much that's affected by your pain. Uh, for the demographics, um, 
remember the group A, they had the facts related as they were. The group B had more reassurance when they when discussing their MRI results. Um, and this graph or this table is actually just showing us that the initially the first group, the first groups and the first assessments were very similar. Next slide, please. Okay. So this table is showing us the difference in scores amongst these three tests, the VAS, the PSEQ, and the SF12. Um, after six weeks, group B shows that there was a significant difference in, the, in pain intensity, which that one is rated by the VAS, uh, ability to undertain, undertake pain while, while doing tasks, and um, general quality of life and functional status, which is a SF12. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a very similar comparison, but just in a uh, graph form. So on the y-axis, we can see how they're, they're um, putting the uh, scale assessment scores. And on the x-axis, we see the progression of these, score, of these scores over, over a period of time um, when they issued out these surveys. Um, at first, both console, both of the groups are very similar, but as we move through time, we can see that the perception of lower back pain and the confidence increases in group B. Remember that the higher values are implying that they have a better confidence in their ability to manage the pain. Um, and at six weeks post MRI, there's a statistical difference between the both groups um, across the board. So these are just the different types of, of the tests that we discussed. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the so for phase two, um, the next the next thing was to identify terminology that's used by the radiologies when they're interpreting these MRIs and seeing if that's gonna catastrophize uh, these results in the, in the patient's mind, right? So how, and also seeing if we were to practice alternate ways of reporting this information while still being, maintaining the integrity of the results, we're not trying to change anything. We're just seeing if, if we're phrasing it in a different way where we're being reassuring, would this make a difference? Not only for how patients are perceiving their own pain, but by how even, clinicians are perceiving their need for further interventions down the road. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this table is pretty interesting. These are a lot of our patients will go in, on Google and just search what they're seeing in their in the interpretation of the MRI. So these things can be pretty scary. Um, I'll go through some of these. So for example, disc herniation, right? This the most frequently asked questions uh, for this for this um, disease would be, does the herniation go away and it's serious? And the answer that Google's providing is uh, untreated severe slip, slip disc can lead to permanent nerve damage and you may lose your bowel or bladder control. Um, so we can see how reading through these, you would see why patients can believe that they're falling into these categories where they may need surgery or they have, they're suffering this permanent damage um, and they're likely focusing on the worst outcomes because this is what, this is what they're reading. Okay, next slide, please. So, and this is, a, this is part of the, the table prior. So it, this is, these are just other examples. So for example, nerve root impingement, um, this is, means that there's not a full compression, but um, the answer that they're seeing for the for their questions like do they do we require surgery? Is this serious? Um, it's if a nerve is pinched for only a short time, there's usually no permanent damage. However, if pressure continues, chronic pain and permanent nerve damage can occur, and then patients are left to interpret that on their own, uh, leading to likely catastrophization of their symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, 
So this table presents an alternate method of how we can report these things without using the words that are considered catastrophizing words. So for example, for any type of disc problem like degeneration, dehydration, desiccation, um, we can use a modified Furman grading. And this is a grading system that radiologists can use uh, to discriminate the severity of disc degeneration. Um, annular tears and annular fissures, these can also be prescribed as high intensity sewn. So this will still keep the integrity of the results, but it's not giving us these words that patients can use and look up and even clinicians can see and maybe think that there's a worse outcome than there actually might be. Um, one good one is a nerve root indentation, impingement or abutment. And this can be described as what it is, a close proximity of disc with nerve without nerve root compression. Um, and so these are just other examples as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is phase three of the study. So this one was a blinded trial. Um, the MRIs were reported to, with both types of ways of reporting, the routine, which is the uh, one that we know that is factual, and then the clinical reporting, which is more of the reassurance and seeing what's important um, to actually, and how to, how to relay this to the patients. And so this, this was assessed by four groups, spine surgeons, general ortho surgeons, ortho residents, and then physiotherapists. Um, and then this was the goal was to assess healthcare provider perception of severity of condition on MRI and decision for choice of treatment between conservative and invasive approach, which would be injections or surgery and perceived probability of that patient requiring surgery. Uh, next slide, please. So, okay. So this slide here is showing that the change in perception of LVP lower back pain severity with either routine MRIs uh, versus a clinical reporting type of MRIs, there was a difference in how orthopedic residents and physiotherapists were perceiving how severe the patient's pain actually was. Um, for spine surgeons, it did not really make much of a difference. Um, we'll talk a little bit about theories of why uh, later. Next slide. And then this is the perception of the disease progression. So what would actually lead to them needing an intervention? And there was a significant decrease in perception of disease progression for the orthopedic residents and physiotherapists, and even for the orthopedic surgeons, spine surgeons didn't really change much here. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this graph is just visualizing the exact same thing we saw on the table before. Um, it's just showing that whether they think this patient will need uh, eventual surgical intervention. Um, and they, they were rating this on a scale of zero to 10 for 20 MRIs. So it wasn't that many, but 20 MRIs, the difference between the, per, the perception was present in all the groups, but as you can see, more in physiotherapists, less in spinal uh, spine surgery surgeons. Um, okay. Um, and the next slide, please. Okay, so lower back pain, it's an extremely common complaint. Uh, physicians often employ advanced imaging studies like MRIs to further evaluate, but it doesn't really change our outcome most of the time, because as Jordan was saying in the beginning, a lot of this comes from the history that you're taking, the patient's clinical picture, their physical exam, um, and this, and so usually MRIs may not be necessary. Most physicians don't read their own MRI images. They rely on radiologists to report results to, the, to us and the patients. Um, spine surgeons, however, they generally do read images on their own and know how they didn't really show much of a significant decrease in progression. So would this be secondary to monetary gain or patient satisfaction concerns, like where patients really want this surgery um, or their experience that they've had? Um, not really sure, but that, that was a difference that we saw. So maybe this could open um, the door for more research here. 
Um, and then we have to think about the downstream effects of usage. So cost, uh, the psychological impact of reporting on patient, for the patients, um, and then unnecessary procedures down the road, unnecessary interventions, um, and then they, those themselves have associated complications that are possible. So some limitations to the study was that the group A had 21 subjects, group B had 23 uh, subjects. So that could lead to a sampling error. Um, also the age of these patients were skewed towards younger middle-aged individual patients, like uh, patients were 39 through 42. Um, but would we really see similar results with older age individuals? And another thing was a time frame. It was a very short time. Um, the study only ran from for, for about six weeks, but with this, would, would we have similar results at six months or five years? Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a little bit about pain perception. Um, and this is just a, a nice a figure that I found, but basically one frames the cause and severity of pain and how, how they frame that actually modulates how they're perceiving their pain. So this is a discussion about whether these MRI results and how patients are interpreting this, is, is this adding to pain catastrophizing? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so why do we continue to use direct interpretation? of MRI findings. Um, physicians' understandings of MRI findings are limited to radiologists' interpretation. We kind of just take their word for it. Um, we need to increase education on changing terminology, but first we need to understand that this the possibility of catastrophization of results. And by doing the all of this, then maybe we can decrease the perceived pain by patient and even by physician to lead to better pain outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so MRI is a tool, not a necessity for lower back pain. So with increased access to advanced imaging, MRI scans are often used to assess, just assess the lower back pain. However, we may need to rethink if this scan is necessary and weigh the benefits versus risks. So the 2016 study found that 31% of lumbar spine MRIs were inappropriate in a healthcare system largely absent of financial and other incentives for ordering. Um, appropriate use of MRI, 53% seen when scan ordered after failure of conservative therapy. So that's why we get a good HMP, we get a good physical exam, um, we monitor the progression of the disease, make sure there's no red flags. Um, and then we've tried the PT, the pain meds, the you know, all of the things that we spoke about, about that would contribute to more conservative management and see if after all of that, or if any red flags present, we could, we could get an MRI to help us. Um, so personally, you know, I would be more conservative about the idea of ordering an MRI. Like as of now, we kind of have to be because insurance, uh, insurance is, usually want to see that we've tried all, a lot of things before we can actually order this. But um, it's good to see the side effects of ordering an MRI that we hadn't thought about and how this affects the patient as well. Um, so always, I would say, uh, if a patient truly presents with the full clinical picture, then definitely. Otherwise, I will, I will continue to be more um, thoughtful and and thinking about whether this will be necessary for outcome changes. Um, and then next slide, please. And then um, potential changes to make in our practice. So learning to identify when an MRI may be inappropriate to avoid ordering imaging that's not gonna provide benefit. And then changing the way that we relay information to decrease this catastrophization of info, which may lead to surgical intervention. Um, next slide. And this uh, is just showing us the AFP guidance. Uh, these are C ratings, but red flags are common in patients with acute low back pain uh, and do not necessarily indicate serious pathology. Therefore, physicians should rely on a whole comprehensive clinical approach 
to evaluating red flags in these patients without findings suggestive of serious pathology, imaging is not indicated in patients with acute low back pain. And then a few others, um, and Jordan will talk a little bit more about other treatment modalities. Thank you. All right, so um, my article uh, entitled The Peer Systematic Review of Randomized Control Trials um, analyzed 15 common um, non-invasive uh, and conservative management strategies that are relatively commonly used in the office, trying to see <clears throat> what evidence was uh, available throughout the databases for support. Um, so looking at Medline, Cochrane, eBase, and the gray literature search, um, our neighbors up north, actually this was published in the Canadian Family Physician, analyzed uh, quite a few studies uh, to find the evidence for these uh, interventions. Uh, so the treatment modalities that we most commonly see are specifically things like oral and topical NSAIDs and acetaminophen, and as we mentioned earlier, oral opioids. But they also investigated uh, several other strategies that may be less common in our regular daily practice, things like um, acupuncture, um, or some of us for things like spinal manipulation um, and the use of SSRIs and SNRIs. Um, they only included RCTs that reported the proportion of the patients that did demonstrate a clinically meaningful, meaning you know, around 30% improvement of their pain through this intervention. Um, and the meta-analysis of these interventions, adults were included um, for if they had reported chronic lower back pain for <laughs> greater than three months of time. And um, were excluded if the, the study did not demonstrate an adequate reporting of the reduction of their pain. Again, as mentioned, 30% um, was kind of a threshold that they were demonstrating as being an effective management strategy for their pain. Now, as I mentioned, this was done in the Canadian family physician, um, and so their evaluation strategy was using the grade system, which is a little bit different than what we've used in the past, and I uh, just wanted to review it a little bit. It is a more subjective synthesis uh, of the, the, the evidence. Um, so there's four levels of competence, uh, slightly different than our um, A, B, C, D, and I uh, listed here. Basically, when they evaluate it, the authors are going to go through and determine whether what level of confidence that they have uh, based on the <clears throat> consensus driven framework that's been established and is available uh, through the BJM. Um, just for kind of standardizing sort of a more subjective um, way of evaluating the evidence. So in this trial, they initially reviewed 847 publications of which 63 met their inclusion criteria. There were eight of the analyzed interventions that had two or more clinical trials for review as listed here. Um, and uh, anticonvulsants and topical NSAIDs only had one trial each that met the criteria. And then actually, as far as their criteria went, acetaminophen, cannabinoids, muscle relaxants, SSRIs, and TCAs did not meet criteria, and so those were not included in the final analysis. Looking here at our kind of publication of the, the overall findings, um, there was moderate, meaning uh, a decent certainty of evidence that uh, exercise, oral NSAIDs, and SNRI, specifically duloxetine, did demonstrate clinically meaningful benefits for patients with this chronic lower back pain. Mm -hmm. Additionally, something interesting that they did analyze with this study that is not necessarily done in many others was long-term benefits. And so exercise also being one of the ones that was included in the greatest number of RCTs um, demonstrated clinical benefits greater than 52 weeks outside of the intervention period. And therefore it was the only um, intervention that demonstrated long-term sustained benefit. This kind of just supporting what we have maybe more anecdotally demonstrated and, and reported to our patients when we try to describe to them how physical therapy, while it might sound like it's not going to be necessarily the thing that is going to be the most benefit for them, 
does have evidence for showing the most sustained benefit. And I think this is probably one of the most important things that we can take away from this um, is again, demonstrating that, that this is evidence for what, what we have known for a long time to be the best outcome for the patients. Now, these studies did not uh, analyze the, these methods being used in conjunction with one another. Um, and so, you know, obviously we would want to consider giving someone some immediate benefit with things like an oral NSAID in addition to their exercise therapy. Um, moving on to the things that demonstrated a lower evidence was um, spinal manipulation therapy um, did demonstrate that it had somewhat of uh, a certainty of evidence for use as demonstrating beneficial effects for the patients. Uh, Rubifacin, uh, specifically things like topical capsaicin um, were included and did demonstrate a good relief for patients. But again, this was a short-term benefit and did not demonstrate any long-term um, relief for pain for the patients. Very low on the ladder was included things like acupuncture and opioids. Um, acupuncture did demonstrate some benefit, especially in the acute period. Um, but when the studies were analyzed for longer than about four weeks, the benefit dropped off. Um, and so they, these studies were generally went out to about 24 weeks for acupuncture and did not demonstrate any continued benefit after the discontinuation of therapy. Opioids, as we know, generally ineffective as far as long-term um, maintaining of pain relief. And then corticosteroid injection, as other studies have demonstrated, are not shown to be an enduring um, relief of the pain. Um, Additionally, the study looked at withdrawals due to adverse effects. And so number one was opioids. Um, they analyzed in these RCTs the withdrawal rates from the study due to adverse effects from the, the treatment modalities. And opioids over and over again were demonstrated to show more, uh, more dropout and more risk of adverse events than any other intervention. SNRIs did demonstrate some additional um, likelihood for patients to withdraw generally from side effects that are known, um, but the, the likelihood for discontinuation was significantly lower. <clears throat> so what does this mean practically for us in, in, pra in our implementation? As we said, it's known exercise, meaning specific structured exercise programs as led by a physical therapist. Um, oral NSAIDs and SNRIs like duloxetine will demonstrate a good relief for our patients in the long term, uh, mostly because they're working on treating the base causes of these, these sources of pain, be they due to radiculopathy or other um, compression syndromes or issues with musculature needing to be strengthened in the area and providing actual relief of that pressure or <clears throat> by relieving some of the swelling in the area. Um, and again, redemonstration that opioids are a poor uh, long-term intervention despite their prevalence in use. Uh, the long-term benefits of exercise being out to 52 weeks, uh, including up to 48 weeks after discontinuation of the intervention, showing long-term sustained relief of the pain, again, can present us with a good uh, source of evidence to present to our patients um, for how we can support that decision. It's always going to remain a challenge uh, when we're talking about trying to do something, especially like exercise, which can be provoking for pain for many of our patients. And therefore, we would continue to recommend that we would want to try and co-administer things like oral NSAIDs to provide them relief, especially immediately before and after their physical therapy, um, allowing those sessions to be more productive and uh, enabling them to participate in a more meaningful way and not have the dropout that would result in reduced long-term benefits. So what do we do with this evidence? You know, as I said, we can continue to consider um, presenting evidence to our patients as we're able, but sometimes that's, that's not necessarily going to be what they want to hear is that I, I read the study in a Canadian journal or I heard a resident present to me on this. Um, but what we can do is try to better educate the public on the things that 
don't show evidence for working, specifically opioids. Um, opioids have again and again been shown to show more harmful outcomes um, and show that they, then generally patients do not tolerate them well and they do not treat the long-term source of their pain. So by helping to allow us to educate our public and our patients a little bit better um, can allow us to help them in the long-term and reduce some of that burden of care. So again, um, just to summarize some of our, our major points for the presentation, chronic lower back pain, we're going to see it almost every day in our clinical practice. And so we want to make sure that we're armed with the best evidence to support what we want to be able to do. There's moderate evidence from RCTs showing that structured exercise, NSAIDs, and duloxetine can give us benefit from the pain. And then the discussion of the, the benefit that we can be demonstrating from our imaging modalities and specifically the way in which we as, as practitioners are going to interpret and discuss those with our patients can have meaningful long-term changes in their way of interpreting and um, dealing with their pain. So these are a good list of our references for the presentation. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Um, let's see in the chat. I think there was one question. It, it just says, what kind of exercises were documented in the study? Sure. So um, they did not go into specific about which exercises were. Again, this was a, a general <clears throat> review of um, the control trials, but they said, you know, commonly prescribed physiotherapy. Um, so it did include things like yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, structured walking exercise programs. So it was a pretty large group of, of things that could be included, but what did need to be included was that they were guided um, and that they, uh, that they were able to, to chart some sort of participation um, in the, the exercise. Any other questions or comments? Well, with that, um, thank you so much um, for presenting to us. I know, as you mentioned, this is something that y'all are seeing every day in clinic. So um, thank you for going over it. Um, thank you also to everybody for joining us. Um, if you could, please, there is a link in the chat. Um, help us give some feedback. And um, other than that, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, everyone.